CEE Central Europe Explained An IDM podcast series powered by Erste Group CEE episode 42 National Minorities and Governance in the Danube Region The Danube Region and Central and Eastern Europe, in other words, everything between Germany and Austria, Moldova and Ukraine and down to the Balkans, is a very diverse region when it comes to national minorities. There are very significant populations of people living in countries neighboring their so-called kin states, such as the Hungarian minority in Slovakia, Transcarpathia in Ukraine, and Transylvania in Romania. There are also minorities with no state of their own, such as the Ruthenian minorities in Slovakia, Ukraine, and Serbia, as well as the Roma minority that could be found around the region. Hello, and welcome to CEE, Central Europe Explained. My name is Jack Gill, and I'm a research associate here at the Institute for the Danube Region in Central Europe. Today's episode focuses on national minorities and governance in the Danube Region. In this discussion, the term national minority refers to a minority group within a country felt to be distinct from the majority because of historical differences of language, religion, culture, and etc. I'm very happy to welcome Sergio Konstantin for today's discussion. Sergio, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, would you like to tell the listeners a little bit about yourself? Hello, hello, Jack. Hello, everybody. And first of all, thank you for inviting me to speak in this podcast. About myself, I'm a senior researcher at the Institute for Minority Rights, Eurac Research, an institute based in South Tyrol in Northern Italy. And uh, my research uh, focuses on issues related with uh, language rights, political participation, and autonomy arrangements in a comparative perspective. Welcome to the podcast. So I'd like to start today's discussion uh, by asking you the question that follows based on your work at Eurex Institute for Minority Rights. And that question is, what do you think um, are the biggest challenges facing national minorities in Central and Eastern Europe? Well, when you started, um, you mentioned the great diversity of uh, national minorities uh, living in this area of the Danube region. And I think the most important challenges that they face are somehow related with their own specific situation. You mentioned there are uh, large minorities, small minorities, territorially concentrated or not minorities with a kin state or without kin state. And of course, their situation on the ground is very much connected with these kind of features. I think in general, minorities in this area uh, face challenges when it comes to preservation of cultural identity. And I'm having in mind here, especially issues related to education in the mother tongue and the use of of minority languages in the public sphere, uh, in relations with public administration, in relations to the other state institutions, or sometimes even in the justice system. And um, regarding the education um, in minority languages or teaching of minority languages, because of course, as I, as I said, the situation of minorities is very different. For some very small minorities or uh, territorially dispersed minorities, it is uh, hardly possible to maintain an education system in the mother tongue, a full-fledged education system in the mother tongue. Therefore, uh, for such minorities, probably uh, a better solution would be uh, a system uh, which ensures that uh, the teaching of the mother tongue uh, is guaranteed and also the teaching of the respective minority culture. And um, on the other hand, for large minorities or territorially concentrated minorities, especially those which uh, have a tradition, a strong tradition of uh, education in the mother tongue, definitely uh, such a system is not enough. So there are claims uh, in various countries across this uh, region uh, from such minorities um, regarding uh, education in the mother tongue from the kindergarten until including also education at university level. And not all countries, this is uh, a reality. Then another um, challenge regards the participation in public life. Here, the question is how to ensure that minorities are not only consulted at, and also they are not only represented formally in elected bodies, but also have the possibility 
to influence the decision-making process, to take decisions on matters which personally or directly affect them. And um, yeah, in several states across the region, there are certain some instruments and mechanisms which aim to ensure this uh, representation and not only representation, but also effective participation. Uh, there are still um, things to be solved in this regard. And the, finally, it's um, also the issue of equality and non-discrimination. And then here, Definitely, we have to speak about the situation of Roma minorities in all the countries in the region, because this is a problem which uh, affects Roma communities in all these countries. And uh, I'm speaking about this uh, vicious circle, this mutual reinforcement of economic deprivation and racial discrimination. We can speak about structural discrimination when it comes to Roma minorities in, in, in this region. And uh, here, definitely, there is a lot of things to be done for the states. When we talk about um, Central and Eastern Europe as a region, uh, I think, sadly, we can't talk about this region without mentioning the current events unfolding in Ukraine. Ukraine has a number of national minorities. So I was wondering, what impact do you think the war is having on national minorities in Ukraine in particular? Again, if you look at the situation of minorities in Ukraine, you'll also understand that uh, how important is the distinction between uh, the different minorities living in Ukraine. Because there are certain minorities in these countries that are now facing challenges regarding the most basic right of uh, minorities, meaning the right to existence. Uh, what happens in Ukraine, in Eastern Ukraine, was described by legal scholars, sometimes not only as ethnic cleansing, but also even as genocide. Whether this qualifies as a genocide or not, there will be probably an international court to decide later on. But what is clear is that certain minorities in, in Ukraine are, are facing uh, basically the prospect of, of basically being uh, or disappear. And I uh, having in mind, for example, the, um, the small Greek minority, Greek community, which before the, the destruction of Mariupol lived in the city and in the surrounding area. It is not very clear how many of these, these members of these minorities are still uh, alive and how many are still living there. Probably some uh, left the region, hopefully before the destruction of the city, became internally displaced person in Ukraine. Some might be even outside Ukraine now uh, as, as refugees. And um, Speaking about eternal displaced person, you should also mention the situation of Crimean Tatars. Even before uh, the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine, Crimean Tatars faced a severe repression following the 2014 illegal annexation of Crimea. Tens of thousands of Crimean Tatars uh, left uh, Crimea after 2014 and became uh, internally displaced persons in other parts of Ukraine. And of course, this created a lot of challenges for this community in terms of ensuring, for example, you no know, education in mother tongue, participation and uh, access to even um, labor market and so on and so forth. As an internal displaced person, uh, you definitely do not have the same opportunities and chances as a local, I would say. And um, if you speak also now about the um, uh, Russian minority in Ukraine, this is a, definitely a different discourse. But there is also clear that Russian minority in Ukraine face uh, uh, a huge challenge when it comes to the situation, involving situation following the Russian invasion. And here we have to pay attention uh, when you speak because um, Putin used this argument, you know, this instrumentalized the situation of Russian minority in Ukraine uh, for geopolitical reasons. And uh, we have to keep in mind that in Eastern Ukraine, we're not only Russian minorities, but they were Russophone minorities. So many of these people uh, speaking Russian in Eastern Ukraine were not ethnically Russian, were uh, belonging to Ukrainians or Jewish or Armenians that were Russified, they were speaking Russian uh, as their native language. So, uh, but it's clear that the war brought a terrible situation on precisely the those communities that uh, Putin claimed to defend. So most of the uh, destructed uh, areas uh, in the eastern Ukraine were inhabited by Russian-speaking communities. The concept of the kin state and kin state involvement in national minorities is very important when we when we talk about uh, national minorities in the Danube region and Central and Eastern Europe. So I would actually briefly ask you, Sergio, if you could explain what is a kin state and, and the role that they play for their kin minorities in neighboring countries. 
most states are ethnically, linguistical, and religious diverse, and uh, they include the communities uh, which share their cultural identity and or have a history, a common history with um, uh, titular groups in uh, other neighboring states. Therefore, as I mentioned also uh, earlier, a kin state is the state in which the majority population uh, share the main elements of its cultural identity, language, religion, ethnicity, and so on and so forth. So uh, minorities are living in a state that is usually known as home state, and they have this uh, connection with a state, which is called kin state, which shares these cultural identity elements uh, and the history. And um, when speaking about kin state, I already mentioned the fact that um, Russia abused this this no this principle of kin state engagement in order to justify its illegal aggression against Ukraine. The basic principle of international law says that uh, home states have the uh, main responsibility to ensure that the rights of minorities living on its territories are protected. However, um, international law also recognizes that uh, the kin states may have a, a legitimate, let's say, uh, concern regarding their kin minorities. And in many uh, occasions, the kin state engagement is beneficial, in fact, for the kin minorities. Kin state involvement can be beneficial, but should be done in cooperation, in consultation with the home state of the respective minorities. And uh, unfortunately, uh, what we can see also in, in the Daniel Bridges is that um, some, some kin state make a kind of instrumental use of this uh, kin state um, engagement. And um, this instrumentalization is, uh, is done for, for domestic or geopolitical gains. Some, some governments in some countries use the kin state en engagement as a, as a tool to consolidate power at home, no? because this is a, a topic which usually um, receives full support from the majorities of the uh, population of the kin state. But the most dis destructive, uh, let's say, policy is the... Um, the policy of uh, so-called geopolitical kin states, which um, use this this kind of uh, mechanism in order to enhance uh, their regional standing and basically for geopolitical gains. And the militarization of kin state engagement that we witness now with the war of Russia against Ukraine is the worst example of such kind of uh, problematic engagement. Uh, so um, yes, kin state engagement can be uh, let's say, uh, can have a positive impact, but um, uh, it should uh, be done in consultation, in cooperation with the home state, and uh, it should respect the principle of uh, international law, uh, meaning the territorial sovereignty of the states, the Pacta Sunt Servanta, a principle of friendly relations among states, and the principle of respect of human rights, especially the non-discrimination. The um, important concept when it comes to national minorities, the concept of autonomy. Sergio, do you think it's fair to say that in the Danube region and Central and Eastern Europe, national minorities tend not to have very much autonomy? And do you think uh, that more autonomy would solve the problems of, of national minorities in this region? Better than speaking about more autonomy, we should speak about what kind of autonomy? Because autonomy is a very like, fuzzy concept, and there's a lot of misunderstanding surrounding this concept, um, especially in the public discourse, you know, among politicians, among uh, journalists. And uh, there's also no uh, common understanding or uh, uh, generally accepted definition of autonomy, um, even uh, within uh, legal scholars and political scientists. There are two, let's say, main types of autonomy, non-territorial autonomy uh, and territorial autonomy. Non-territorial autonomy is also sometimes called cultural autonomy, uh, sometimes it's called functional autonomy, while territorial autonomy sometimes is called the political autonomy. And uh, certain terms like uh, uh, self-government, uh, decentralization, self-determination even, federalization, when are used as an interchangeable term for um, 
uh, territorial autonomy, which is not always uh, the case. So this is a so, you know, the main problem is the main challenge is to um, uh, to basically explain when you have a discussion about autonomy, what is the meaning, what is the scope uh, of the, the, the concept. And when it comes to the Danube region, we see in fact that in reality, uh, these ideal types are usually combined. So most of territorial autonomies have also cultural autonomies, or cultural autonomy uh, features because they deal with also with issues like education and culture. Uh, and also uh, most non-territorial autonomy, cultural autonomy also have a territorial, uh, let's say dimension because the states have to decide on which territory they apply, either the level of the whole country or on certain parts of certain regional or territorial administrative units. And in the Danube region, we have examples of both types, as I said, of, of autonomy. Uh, most countries in the region, in fact, uh, um, opted for cultural autonomy, so non-territorial cultural autonomy systems. There are only two examples of territorial autonomies. One is uh, Vojvodina in Serbia, and the other one is Gagauzia in, in Republic of Moldova. Uh, and uh, it's interesting to, to look at these two territorial autonomies because they are quite different in terms of, let's say, um, philosophic concept be behind them. Because um, Gagauzia, for example, is, a, is an autonomy for a certain group. It was established based on referendums done in, uh, in several municipalities uh, with um, you know, over 50% majority of the ghost population and other municipalities, which, well, there were certain criteria. The bottom line is that this autonomy is basically an autonomy for Gagauz people, more than eight, almost 84% of the population is Gagauz. While in the case of Vojvodina, this is a different form of autonomy. Uh, the ethnic element definitely was one of the factors that were taken into consideration for establishing this autonomy. But when you look at the legal design of the autonomy, it's clear that here the territorial um, feature is more important than the ethnicity itself, because um, this territorial autonomy uh, is granted to a region which is multi-ethnic and multilingual and multicultural. The uh, Vojvodina um, autonomy, uh, statute of autonomy, provides for the official use of five minority languages besides Serbian uh, in the working of the public administration of, of the, the um, of the autonomous region. So you see, we have this distinction between, let's say, uh, in the academic literature, was called. Uh, owned autonomy, so an autonomy that we can say that is owned in a certain extent by a group, and autonomy that is shared, so shared autonomy, an autonomy which regards mostly the territory and which takes into consideration the ethnic linguistic diversity within the autonomy itself. Because this is, in fact, now we speak about autonomy and challenges uh, regarding the autonomous systems. and. One of the challenges regarding the territorial autonomy is, uh, first of all, as I, as I mentioned, within the territorial autonomy itself, there are minorities living in these autonomous regions, and the autonomous system has to establish, to establish a system which ensures that the rights of these internal minorities are respected as well. And uh, the, the biggest, uh, let's say, um, challenge regarding territorial autonomy or the biggest argument against uh, the territorial autonomy that uh, most of the governments uh, in the Danube region raise is uh, the fear that the territorial autonomy in fact uh, creates the condition for secession. They see it as a stepping stone to secession. In fact, this kind of territorial arrangement giving power, legislative powers to uh, this uh, autonomous region shows that the territory, respective territory is also via, can work as a viable, uh, let's say, entity, uh, even without uh, the center, and um, uh, encourages the local political elites to claim you no know, external self-determination, uh, because uh, now the logic of um, uh, why, why to, to be a small fish in a, in a big pool, when uh, I can be a big fish in a small pool. And uh, this is why I would say uh, countries in the region are, are not, are very reluctant in accepting territorial autonomy arrangements. And most of them um, offered instead uh, cultural autonomy to minority groups. 
Uh, however, also the cultural autonomy arrangements um, have, let's say, arguments in favor and against. Uh, in terms of arguments in favor is the fact that um, cultural autonomy can be offered to both uh, regionally concentrated and uh, dispersed minority groups. Uh, that it's also based on the individual will of members of these minority groups. And that, um, in fact, uh, it acknowledges the, the multi-ethnic, uh, multinational character of a state without giving rise to, to territorial claims. And therefore, uh, it uh, somehow uh, put to rest any uh, separatism, uh, minority separatism. However, there are also issues regarding that, uh, regarding cultural autonomy, in which the issue of how to uh, establish the affiliation to the minority group, who decides who is a member of the minority group, problematic to give this power to the state to establish certain criteria. And another problem regarding cultural autonomy is that uh, might create this kind of um, compartmentalization of, of, of the civil society because each community will try to create a kind of monolingual environment or monocultural environment instead of having this kind of dialogue between culture at the level of the society will have this kind of compartments you now each community managing its own education culture and, and so on and so forth it's very interesting because i think many people think that autonomy um, is a kind of fix all solution but it also clearly you know, very much comes with its own problems but unfortunately we kind of have to leave it there but um, as always, we like to ask our guests if there is a piece of art or music or literature or film concerning today's discussion that you'd recommend to bring further reflection. Yes, uh, just one more, just a few more words about the autonomy. I just want to uh, underline the fact that autonomy is not a fix, fix all solution. Building a well functioning autonomy is a, is a long term process which requires a a full commitment of political elites at the uh, state and sub-state level, regional level. And uh, the autonomy is also not a static solution. So what has been established uh, maybe 10 decades ago is already probably outdated. So autonomy requires uh, permanent uh, maintenance work. Uh, it requires um, periodic assessment and also updates and reforms whenever um, uh, the say, society changes. The realities are changing, therefore the autonomy uh, arrangement themselves have to be updated to these new realities. And regarding the, um, your recommendations, first I would recommend a book by uh, Ivo Andrich. Uh, it's called The Bridge on the Drina. Uh, this book came to my mind recently because I've seen in the news uh, again um, that uh, tensions are raising in uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina in Kosovo as well. This uh, book of Ivo Andrić uh, is a historical novel. Uh, and um, I think it's a very, offers a very good overview to uh, potential readers uh, who do not have a, a very deep knowledge of realities of this area of contact between East and West, between different communities uh, in terms of ethnicity, language, uh, religion. And uh, finally, I would like to recommend an Ukrainian band called the uh, Daka Braka, uh, which is um, a hard to define uh, band in terms of music style. They call their style ethno chaos because um, they uh, uh, include in their music uh, uh, various, let's say, uh, influences from different parts of Ukraine and also from uh, the musical traditions of different uh, ethnic groups living in the country. Uh, Sergio, thank you again very much for joining us today, uh, for giving these insights into, the, into my national minorities in the Danube region in Central Europe. It's been really fascinating. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And also many thanks to our listeners. Um, we hope you found today's episode insightful and uh, stay tuned until next time. So you enjoyed this podcast? Then tune into another CEE episode and subscribe to the IDM podcast series on Apple Podcast, Spotify or elsewhere you get your podcast. And also have a look at the rest of our work on our website 
idm.it. And please, for any feedback and podcast collaboration, feel free to contact us. This was CEE, Central Europe Explained, a podcast series produced by the Institute for the Danube Region and Central Europe. IDM Podcast. Institute for the Donauraum and Middle Europa. Institute for the Danube Region and Central Europe. European Perspectives. Regional Actions. Cooperation and Expertise since 1953.